This video is sponsored by Dev Mountain. If you're interested in learning web development, iOS, or UX design, Dev Mountain is a 12 week design and development boot camp intended to get you a full time position in the industry. To learn more, visit devmountain.com or click the link in the description below. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to my Go Programming Language Crash Course. And in this course, we're going to look at all the fundamentals of Go. We're going to set up a workspace properly and look at things like variables, arrays and slices, pointers, uh, conditionals, just all the core things that you need to know to begin to write applications with this language. And Go is extremely efficient, extremely fast. It was it was created by Google. It's used for a whole bunch of stuff, including web development. I do plan on doing more videos where we actually build um, some web apps, some back end web apps using Go. Uh, but I want this to be kind of an intro to the language. So this would be your first stop when wanting to learn this language. All right. So first thing you need to do is install it. So if you go to golang.org, click on this button right here and just choose, you know, whatever you use, Windows, Mac, Linux. I'm on a Mac, so I would choose this, but I already have it installed because it's a very self-explanatory process, just like installing anything. And then once you have it installed, just go ahead and open up a terminal or your command prompt in, in Windows or Git bash, whatever it is you use and just do a go version. And you should see something like this that will let you know that it's installed correctly. All right. So first topic I want to cover is the workspace, because this is very important. It's a very opinionated language when it comes to how how to set up your file and folder structure. So this page is from the documentation. If I remember, I'll put it in the description and it kind of shows you how to create a workspace. Uh, it says right here, Go programmers typically keep all their Go code in a single workspace, and that includes your project code as well as any third party uh, packages that you install. Because with Go, you have a command called Go get. In fact, I'll go ahead and say Go help. This shows us all the different commands and you can see there's a get command to download and install packages and dependencies. And there's a website called godoc.org where you can see all the, the packages. You can search for them. Some of them are hosted on GitHub. Some are on like golang.org and so on. All right. And I'll show you how to install uh, one of these in a little bit. But down here you can see uh, your workspace should have a source folder and a bin folder and it kind of gives you an idea of, of what it should look like down here. But I created a text file. Let me just open that real quick. That kind of really shows you how your workspace should be set up. So you have your main folder. OK, so this in this case, it's called Go. You have your bin in your source. So binaries in your source code package. This is for if you install third party packages, it'll create this folder. But your source folder is is your your main folder. And in here you want to put a folder like GitHub.com if you're going to use GitHub. Of course, you could use like GitLab or something like that. But you want to use uh, version control, <coughs> excuse me, version control with your Go projects. OK, so GitHub.com and then a folder with whatever your GitHub username is. And then in there is where you put your projects. OK, so you see Go Project One, Go Project Two and so on. And then when you install a, a package, if it's hosted at GitHub, for example, it'll actually get put in this GitHub.com folder. OK, so that's the basic idea of how um, how your your Go projects should be structured. I apologize if you can hear the rain. It's it's pouring out there. I actually just got a, a flash flood warning on my phone. But anyway, so let's create a workspace. OK, now if I clear this up and I do a Go ENV, this shows me my Go environment. OK, and I, what I want you to look at is the Go path. And by default, it's going to be in your home directory. So users, whatever, slash go. And you can change this if you want. You can make your workspace anywhere, but you need to make sure that you set the go path environment variable. OK, and it's different if you're on Windows or Mac or Linux. I'm not going to go through that. I'm just going to use the default workspace. OK, so in my home directory, I'm going to create a directory called go. And you don't have to use your terminal for this. You can use your finder or Windows Explorer or whatever you want. Um, but let's make a directory called go. Let's cd into go. Let's make two directories. So one is bin and one is source. And let's cd into source. And then let's create a directory called github.com. cd into github.com and then make a directory with your GitHub username. In my case is Brad Traversy, and then I'm going to cd into that folder 
And then this is where we create our project. So I'm going to make a directory called go underscore crash underscore course. Okay, and the idea of this project is just to have a bunch of folders with a go file in it. And for instance, we'll have like 01 hello for the hello world project, 02 variables for variables, you know, 03 arrays or whatever. And then you guys will have that as a reference. I'm going to put this into a Git repository and then I'll put the link in the description for you guys if you're not following along. So let's CD into go crash course. All right. And in here, I'm, going to, I'm just going to open up my text editor in this folder. I'm using Visual Studio Code so I can say code dot, which will open the current directory that I'm in. Okay, so you can see over here I have go crash course open. Now, if you're using VS Code, I would suggest hitting the extension icon here and searching for the go extension. You can see I have it installed right here. This will help with like um, IntelliSense and, you know, give you drop downs for methods and stuff like that. You can also do testing and diagnostics. I would definitely recommend it. And when you create a go file, you might see some pop ups to install certain packages that can help you out. And I would suggest installing those as well. All right. Now, before I create anything over here, I just want to show you how to install um, something using go get. So from godoc.org, I'm just going to grab this right here. So the GitHub link and then we'll go to the terminal. Okay, it doesn't matter where you are in the terminal. You can run this from anywhere and go get and then let's go ahead and paste that link in and run it. Okay, so this is kind of like doing an NPM install or a pip install. or something like that. All right. Now I'm going to go to my finder and go to my go workspace that we created and notice it created a package folder. But also if we look in source and github.com, there's the AWS package that we just installed because it's coming from GitHub. It's going to get put in the GitHub folder. So you can see that the structure is very, very opinionated. If we installed something from Golang, it would install or I'm sorry, it would create a golang.org folder right here in the source automatically. All right. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how the workspaces work. All right. So now let's jump into VS Code and I'm going to create a folder here. I'm going to call it 01 underscore hello because I just want to do a simple hello world. And I'm going to create a file called main.go. Okay, main is is the common convention for the 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 entry point, the main file. It's like an index PHP um, or you know an index HTML, whatever. So let's see. Down here, you may see some pop-ups once you create the file. If not, click on this analysis tools missing, and it's going to ask you to install some packages. I'm going to click install, and if we look at our workspace now inside GitHub.com. You'll see that it's installing some stuff here that's going to help that'll help us out in the, the editor. Also, some stuff is from golang.org, like I said, so it'll create a folder itself. Um, but yeah, so those will get installed. Just we'll just let that run. So let's create our first go file. All right. Now, all I want this to do is just I just want it to be a simple hello world. So in Go, you have a, a main function. Okay, it's a function called main and it runs automatically. It's kind of like in Java, C sharp and a lot of those other languages. Uh, but to use the or to create the, the main function, we need to do package main at the top. Okay, then we need to declare the function with func main. I'm going to do a section on functions. So I'll explain that a little later on, but we're just creating a function called main and this will run automatically. We don't have to come down here and say like main or anything like that. Um, now, I just wanted to output hello world in the console. To do that, we actually need to import a package called FMT. Okay, I think it stands for formatter or format, um, but this has a couple methods to be able to print stuff uh, on the screen. Uh, now, when you import stuff, when you do anything with with um, quotes, you want to use double quotes. Okay, you'll get an error if you use single quotes. And then down here, let's take that formatter. I call it the formatter. I don't know if that's correct or not, but let's say print line. Okay, so we have print, print format, and print line. Print will just do an inline. It won't put push the next on, you know, the next thing onto the next line. So we're going to use print line. And then in here, let's say hello world. Okay, we'll save that, and that's our hello world. Okay, now to run this, 
I'm going to go to my integrated terminal, but of course, you know, you can use any terminal or command line. And then you want to let's see, we're going to go into 01 hello. And to run this, we use the go run command. So go run and then the name of the file, which is main.go. And there we go. We get hello world. Okay, so before we move on here, I just want to quickly show you how to compile and create a binary, okay, create um, an, an executable file. So for that, we can simply say go install. Okay, we don't get any output here, but I want to show you that if we go to our workspace, uh, I'll just go back home, we'll go into the go folder and now we'll go into the bin folder and you'll see 01 hello. It's an actual executable that you can run from the terminal. So if I were to open a terminal in my bin folder here and let's do an LS and you can see the 01 hello, I can do dot slash meaning the current directory 01 underscore hello and run it and we get hello world. So it actually runs our program. So it's that easy to compile and create an executable with go. All right, so let's move on here. We did our hello world. So now I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call it 02 underscore vars because I want to talk about variables and data types. Uh, we're going to create a file called main dot go here. Okay, and I just want to I sh probably should have mentioned this earlier, but if you don't want to follow along and like create all these files and stuff or even set up the environment, there's something called the go playground. I spelled that wrong, but it's fine. So it's play.golang.org and you can just run go code in this this um, GUI right here if you want, if you don't want to set everything up. I probably should have said that earlier, but whatever. So let's see, we're going to grab this stuff from the hello project and put it in here. And let's talk about data types before we create variables. So I'm going to actually paste something in here. Okay, so these are some of the I think I don't know if these are all the types, but these are most of them. Um, and a lot of these we won't even use, but the most important is string bool for Boolean int integer um, for floats or decimals. We have float 32 and float 64 float 64 is, is the one we usually use. And we have different iterations of int. So in eight through 64, which just it, it corresponds to the length of the integer. Okay, and then an unsigned int is going to be zero plus, so no negative numbers. And that also goes eight through 64. And a byte is just an alias for an unsigned int eight. Okay, and a rune is an alias for an int 32. And then we have float 32, float 64, and then complex is for like really large numbers. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a variable. So there's a couple ways to do it. First one I'm going to show you is using. the var keyword. Okay, so let's do var name. I'm going to say this is going to be a string type and it's going to equal value. Okay, make sure you use double double uh, quotes here and no semicolons, okay? And then let's go ahead and take the format and let's do a print line and let's print out name and save this, okay? Now to run this, we have to cd into 02 underscore vars and then just run the, the go rain, go run main dot go and we get Brad. All right. Now, you notice in VS code, we have this little green line. It's not an error. It's kind of just like an info information block. And it says you should omit the type string from the declaration because it's inferred that it's inferred. Okay, so basically it knows that this is going to be a string even if I don't do this. So I don't actually have to put in string in this situation. So if I save, you'll see if I run it, it does the same thing. Okay, so if you're creating a string, you don't technically need to, to add string there. Okay, now if we do, let's say var age equals, um, let's actually do var age int Uh, equals 37. Now I want if I save this, we're going to get an error. Okay, so this error is because we're not using the variable and go when you create a variable, you actually have to use it. So you age declared and not used. And if we run this file, we get the same error. Okay, so if we go down here to the print and I throw in comma age to print them both out, then that error goes away and we can run it. 
Okay, now we get the same green line we got before because again, it's going to it's going to infer that this is going to be an int. So I don't even need to do that. And I'll save and run and there we go. Now I want to show you how to get the type. So to get the type, we're going to use uh, for uh, FMT dot print F and print F will take in something called a point um, a format receiver. I believe it's called. I'm actually going to search for go FMT. And it's this go FMT. No, is this it? No, it's not it. It's this right here. The first one. I think this is it. Yeah, so down here we have um, different verbs that we can use verbs or, or format pointers. I forget what these are called, but they're for different things. Like if you want to use a Boolean, you would use percent underscore T uh, for integers. You have you have different ones for different bases like base two is percent B base 10 is percent D and so on. But what I'm looking for is this one right here, percent uppercase T. And it says a go syntax representation of the type of the value. Okay, so that's what we want to use to get the type. So in here we'll say percent uppercase T and then I'm just going to do new line. So just slash N and second parameter will be what we want to find the type of. So let's do we'll say name. Okay, what's going on here? Um, oh, I forgot the T. All right, so let's let's clear this out and run it and we get our our Brad 37 that's coming from this line and then we get string because it's telling us what type name is. We put age in here and we run that we get int. Okay. now if I want to specifically cast this age as let's say an int 32, then I would do that here. So we can say int 32 and save. And now let's take a look at the type of age. And it's now in 32. Okay, so if you want to specifically change it to a different data type, you can do that. All right, so let's see. Let's let's look at um, let's look at const. Okay, so I'm going to take that age, right? And I'm gonna actually let's do let's do something different. We'll do var. Uh, we'll say is cool and set it to true. If I save this, we'll get an error because we're not actually using the variable. So I'll just put in here is cool. All right. And then let's actually look at the type. I'm sure you guys can guess what type that's going to be. So if I run this, we get bool. Okay, because it's a Boolean. Now I can take this is cool right here and I can then say that I want it to be false. Okay, so if we go ahead and run this, you can see that now it's false. So I can do that because I use var, but if I use const and this is just like JavaScript ES6, if I use const and you'll see we already have an error here, cannot assign to is cool. If I run it, we get the same error because it's a constant. It means that you can't redefine it. Okay, so I'll just get rid of that. So that's const. Now I want to look at the second way to create a variable, and that's the shorthand method. Now, this method you can only use within a function, and I'm going to actually give you an example of that. Let's take let's take the name here. I'm just going to comment it, copy it and comment it out and put it outside of the main function like that and then run this file and it still works. So it's fine to declare the name up here uh, in, you know, a global variable and use it down here. Now, the shorthand method that I'm going to show you is without the var. So just name and then colon equals and then whatever you want to assign it. So let's say Brad. All right. Now, if I save this, you'll see we get an error and it says non declaration statement outside function body. So this this type of assignment we cannot do outside of a function. So I'm just going to copy it or cut it and then put this down here. Let's put a comment here and I'll just say shorthand and save and now we get no errors. Okay, it runs. Everything's fine and it's going to assume that it's a string. If I if I check the type of it here, we say name. It should show us that it's a string. Okay, so you'll see this quite a bit. Okay, unless of course it's outside of a function or it needs to be like a, a different 
type of uh, different data type or whatever. All right. Um, I didn't do any floats. So let's do like uh, we'll just say size. and set that to like 1.3 and if we look at the type of size let me just show you real quick there is no actual just float it's going to be a float 64 okay that's going to be that's what's inferred um if you wanted to specifically say a float 32 then you could go up here and say like var uh size float 32 equals and then whatever 2.3 And then we'll get rid of that. Okay, we'll save that, run it, and you can see now it's a float 32. All right, so I think that's going to be it for variables, guys. I don't want to waste too much time. Oh, one more thing I want to show you. If you have um there's you can actually do uh kind of save some time here, like if we had email and we'll say brad at @gmail. So instead of doing this, we can actually shorten this up and we can say name email and then do our assignment to brad okay so we could do that instead so i'm going to just comment that out email will throw us an error if we don't use it so let's throw it in here and save and run and it should work okay you can see that that still works so just a shorter way to assign variables All right, so I'm going to close that up and let's create a new folder here and I'm going to call this 03 packages. Okay? I want to talk about packages, so let's create a file called main.go. Let's clear this up and let's copy our initial hello world. Okay? Now, I've showed you how we can import a, a core package like fmt. If you want to import more than one, then you want to wrap this in parentheses. Okay? And then you don't want to put a comma here. No comma. So we'll just put a space and then let's bring in the math package. Now, notice the different colors here in VS Code. It's because this isn't formatted correctly. What you want to do is put these on separate lines. So I could do that. uh but you're more than likely going to see it like this I have prettier installed the extension prettier for VS code so it'll automatically format it like this when I save but th yeah this is how you import it now if I go ahead and save this file I don't know if it's a VS code thing or if it does this in every editor but the package will disappear if I'm not using it anywhere okay so I'm going to undo that but yeah if I save it goes away So let's go ahead and use it. So down here, let's say print line, we'll take math and let's use floor which will round whatever we pass in down. So we'll say 2.7. Okay? So if we go down here and we run that, we need to actually go into that directory. CD out of that and then CD into 03 packages and we'll run main.go and we get 2. Okay, we also have the seal method, so we can do seal 2.7 and we should get 3. Okay, so we get 3. We can do like uh what else? Let's do let's do square root. So capital S Q R T and let's do 16. Okay, if we run that, we get 4. All right, I don't want to spend too much time on the math package. That's not the point of this. It's just to show you how to bring in a package and use it. Now we can create our own packages as well. So if I would create a folder here, I'm going to call it STR util for string utilities and then create a file here. I'm going to call it reverse.go and I want this to be a function that returns a string. Or I'm sorry, returns a, a reverse string or reverses a string. Now we have to claim this as a package and you'll see VS Code will actually look at the folder name and give you that as an option and that's what we want. Okay? Now for the function, I'm just going to go ahead and search for golang reverse string. And this first stack overflow post has a good answer right here, so we'll grab that and just paste that in. All right. So now we have this reverse.go. Ignore this little info thing. 
Uh, we'll get into functions later. But now we should be able to import this. So we're going to go down here on this next line and let's say GitHub. We want to start from the source folder. So GitHub dot com slash um, Brad Traversy or whatever your username is and then the go crash course and then what is it zero three packages and then str util. So that should bring it in and then I should be able to use it. So I'll do a FMT dot uh, print line. Let's do yeah print line and we'll take the str util and we should be able to say dot reverse and let's pass in a string of hello backwards. All right. So now when we run this, it should give us hello. And there we go. So we get hello. If we were to change this to hello and we run it, it should now give us hello backwards because it's going to reverse it. So that's how you can create your own package. You can also, like I showed you, install packages with go get and then you can simply import them the same exact way. So you would do GitHub um, slash AWS in, you know, the one that I downloaded or whatever, and then whatever you want to bring in. All right. So that's packages. Like I said, I'm going to be moving kind of fast here because there's a lot to cover. Uh, so let's create 04 and this is going to be functions. Okay, so let's say new file main dot go. Let's copy our initial hello world. And I'm going to create a new function up here. Clear that up. All right. So this is this is actually pretty simple. If you if you know any other language, a lot of this stuff is going to be really easy, like the conditionals and the functions, the loops. It's very it's very simple. So let's create a function with the funk keyword. I'll call it greeting. And I want this to take in a parameter of a name. So we'll pass in name. Now we want to put the type of this, which should be a string. And then we also want to put the return type. Okay, so string for the return. And if you don't have a return type, you can just leave that blank. Uh, but what I want to do here is return. Uh, you want to use double quotes and we'll just say hello. And then let's concatenate. Okay, it's the same as uh, JavaScript concatenation. You just whoops, use the um, what am I doing? Hold on a second here. What did I do? I went to the different file. Um, just like JavaScript, you can use a plus sign and then, you know, put the variable name. So down here. Let's go ahead and let's run that. So actually we want we want to do a format print line because we're not we're not doing any output here. We're just returning a value. So we have to wrap this in print line and we'll say greeting and let's run this. So let's go. Whoops, let's go into the correct folder. Functions and let's run main dot go. Not enough arguments. That's because I forgot the name. Okay, we'll run it again and we get hello Brad. Okay, so very simple function. Let's create one more. So we'll, we'll call this one get some. Okay, so this is going to take in two uh, numbers, obviously. So we'll say num1, which will be an int, and num2, which will be an int, and it's going to return an int. Okay, and then we're going to say return num1 plus num2. And then let's go down here and replace this with get sum. And let's pass in, let's say three and four, save that and let's run it and we get seven. Okay, so pretty simple. Now, if you want to shorten this up a little bit, since these are both ints, we don't need the first one. We can just do num1 comma num2 int. And that should still work with no problem. All right. So, I mean, there's 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 other advanced stuff you can get into, you know, advanced functions, but I want to keep this light. This is just an introductory course, so I'm just covering the basics here. Um, plus, we don't I don't want this to be a three hour video. So let's create our, the next folder, which is going to be 05 arrays underscore slices. Okay, we're going to talk about arrays and slices in this one. So main dot go. All right. 
And I will be pushing this to get. In fact, I'm just going to initialize my repository now. I'm not going to do my commits and stuff till after, but just wanted to initialize it. Uh, so let's see, we're going to first look at arrays. So let's copy our hello world here. And let's see, we'll get rid of that. We'll say arrays. Now, with Go, your arrays have to be a fixed length, okay? And you have to name the types as well. Um, that can be a problem because you don't always know your, how, ma how many values are going to be in your array. So that's where slices comes in, which a slice is basically an array that doesn't have a fixed type. But let's start with just array. So let's say fruit array, and we're going to set this to have two values and it'll be string. Okay, actually, we don't need a space here. And then down here, let's say uh, assign values. So we'll say fruit array. Let's take the zero index and assign it to a string of Apple. And then we'll copy that down. This one here, we'll say orange say one and then let's print it out. So format dot print line and say fruit array and save. OK, I'm just going to navigate to the correct folder. And let's run the go file and we get apple and orange. OK, if we want to specify uh, a certain one, of course, we could just put the index in. It's zero base, just like most other languages. So the one spot is going to be the what the second value. So if we run that, we get orange. OK, um, let's see. If I were to actually, I want to show you how we can declare the array and assign these at the same time. So let's say declare and assign. And I'm just going to comment these out. OK, so to, to declare and assign, we can say fruits or fruit array, uh, no var. And then let's do our colon equals. And we're going to say to uh, string and then let's put in some curly braces and then we'll put in our values. OK, so if we save that and we run this, we get the same thing. So this is the same as what we did here, just a shorter way of doing it. So now let's take a look at slices. So I'm going to comment these out. And I mean, a slice is it's pretty much the same thing. So we could just kind of copy this. And let's call it fruit slice and then just take away the two right here. OK, so apple orange, let's put another one in like grape. Um, declare. Yeah, so I'm just getting a declared and not used error. So I want to print this. OK, and we'll run that and you can see we have all three there. And just to show you if it was in a, uh, an array that was that had two values and we run this. We get an, an error that says index two is out of bounds. OK, so this is index two zero one two and it says it's out of bounds. OK, so we'll save that. Um, let's see, I think that's pretty much it. I don't want to go over like specific um, methods and stuff like that. If you want to count the number of uh, stuff in the array or in the slice, you can use len. We wrap this in len and we run that. You'll see we get three, okay, because there's three values in there. If you want to get like a range, what we could do is format dot uh, print line and we could say fruit slice and let's say we want one colon two and run that and it just gives us orange. OK, and the reason for that is it starts at one and then it stops at two or before actually before two. It's, it does it. It's not going to give us the grape. So if I put another one here, 
like let's say um, cherry and we do one three we should get orange and grape okay so you can see that right here all right so let's clear this up and let's create a new folder and I'll try to remember to timestamp these as well I'm going to do 06 uh, conditionals Okay, so let's create main dot go and we'll grab this. Okay, so conditionals pretty easy. Um, if you know when, like I said, if you know any other language, this is very similar, especially if it's a C syntax language. Uh, we're going to assign a couple variables here. Let's say X equals five and Y equals 10. And then we'll do an if statement. Now, it, it doesn't common practice is to not use parentheses like if we say X is less than Y like that. But if you use parentheses here, it doesn't throw an error or anything. It still works. Um, but I think common convention is to not use them. So let's say if this is less than Y, let's do a pr uh, format dot print F. And. And here what I'm going to do is say percent D, which is used for base 10 ints, which which is what these are. And I'm going to say is less than percent D. So these are like placeholders. Um, and if you've used print F or, or sprint F in other languages, you probably know how this works. So now we'll put in X and Y. Okay, so basically. This is a placeholder for the first one here. X. This is a placeholder for the next. So it should say X is less than Y. Okay, and that would be correct because that's the condition. So let's CD into the right place and run main dot go, and we get five is less than ten. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, see, I didn't put a new line here. That's the reason for the slash n because. You can see right here it's, it didn't push this on to the next line. So we want to make sure we do that and we get five is less than 10, which is true. So if we change the X to 15 and run it, well, I'm sure you guys know what's going to happen. Nothing because this is just a, a, a simple if now if we put an else here and we can just copy this. And let's just simply change the place uh, places of X and Y because now Y will come first. Okay, we'll go ahead and run it and we get 10 is less than 15. Um, so we can use greater than less than. Of course, we can use less than or equal to greater than or equal to. So let's say if X is less than or equal to Y, then is less than or equal to. or equal to and then we'll set these equal and run it and we get 10 is less than or equal to 10. Okay, so very simple. Let me just put a comment here. We'll say if else let's go down here. Now let's look at uh, an else if So what I'm going to do is create a variable called color and set it to a string of red. All right. And then we'll say if color is equal to red. Then let's uh, let's just format print line and we'll say color is red. And then we want to do an else if to check for something else specific. So else if we'll say color is equal to blue. Then let's uh, copy this, paste that in and let's say color is blue. Oops, not blur. And then just do an else. So if it doesn't match either of these, then let's format we'll say color is not blue or red okay so we'll run this and we get color is red change it to blue 
color is blue, change it to green, and we get color is not blue or red. All right, very simple. So let's take a look at a switch and we'll use the same example. I'll, I'll even use this color variable. So we'll say switch and then what we want to test, which is the color. And then we want to present cases. So we'll say case red. Okay, what do we want to do? We'll print out color is red. We want to stay within these parentheses, these curly braces for the switch and put another case of blue. And let's say color is blue. And then we want a default, okay? Because if it's not red or blue, then let's print out color is not uh, not blue or red. All right. So let's try it out, run it and we get the same thing. Color is not blue or red. If I were to change the color here to red and save and run, we get color is red for both the if else and the switch. Okay, so I think that's going to be it for conditionals. And of course, you can do like, you know, and and or and whoops or stuff like that as well, if you want more than one. Uh, but yeah, that's conditionals. Let's go ahead and create a new folder here. This is going to be 07 and this is actually going to be loops. Okay. So loops and let's say main.go. Okay. And let's copy that. All right. So, let's see. We're going to do a we're going to do a couple for loops. Um There's basically a, like a long method and a short method. So let's do the long method and we're going to just create a variable called I set it to one and we're going to say four and then our condition, which is let's say if I is less than or equal to 10, then we want to FMT print line and let's just print I. And then we want to increment by one. So we'll say I equals I plus one. And let's run this. So we'll go into what is it? Oh, seven loops. And let's run the go file and we get one. It prints out one through ten. And I know a lot of you guys are probably yelling at the screen because instead of doing that, an easier way is to do I plus plus. Okay, so that'll do the same thing. It just adds one. So for each iteration, one gets added. Um, now we can do a short method as well, which resembles most other languages that have four loops. So we can say four and then put the assignment in here. So so four oops, I equals one semicolon. Then we put the conditional if it's less than or equal to 10. and semicolon and then do the increment and then simply print out. Actually, let's do a dot print F and we'll do we'll still just put in like the text number and then uh, let's do what is it? It's a, we want a base 10 integer. So it's a percent D and new line and then just pass in I. Okay, so now when we run this, we should see number one through number 10 and there we go. All right, cool. So let's do a quick FizzBuzz challenge here. Okay, so if you don't know what FizzBuzz is, it's a common interview question uh, for, you know, many different languages. And basically they want you to loop through 100. So have it print out whatever one through 100. And for every multiple of three, it should output the word Fizz. For every multiple of five, it should output buzz. And for every multiple of three and five, it should output fizz buzz. Okay. So I know I know a lot of you guys probably know the answer to this, but just to show you how to do it in Go, which is basically the same in, in every language, we'll say uh, for I we'll set that to one. Let's say I is less than or equal to 100 and then I plus plus. All right. Now, 
the way the solution that that I always use, which is the most popular, is to first check to see if uh, it's divisible by 15. Because if it's divisible by 15, it's divisible by 3 and 5, right? So we just want to do an if statement, and we'll say if um, I, and we want to use the modulus operator, a modulo, whatever. Uh, I don't. Some people say modulo, some say modulus, but basically this is used to find a remainder. Okay, so if we say if I modulus 15, if that's equal to zero, that means there's no remainder. So that means that this is divisible by 15. Okay, so if that's true, then we want to output fizzbuzz. So let's say print line and let's output fizzbuzz. Okay, then we want to do an else if. So now we want to check to see if it's divisible by three. So we can simply say if I uh, modulus three is equal to zero, then let's actually I'll just copy this. Then let's just output fizz. Okay, if it's divisible by three, and then let's do another else if, and we'll say if I modulus five is equal to zero. We'll print out just buzz. And then else, if it's not divisible by any of those, then we just want to print out the actual number, which is just I. OK, so let's save that and let's try it. Let's see if I pass the interview. All right, so we'll go up to one. OK, so one, two, fizz. Okay, so remember, if it's divisible by three, we get fizz. Four, five, buzz. Six is fizz because that's divisible by three. Nine, fizz, divisible by three. Ten, divisible by five. Fifteen, fizz, buzz because it's divisible by uh, both. And then thirty should be the next one. So fizz, buzz for thirty. Forty-five should be the next one. Fizz, buzz for forty-five. We have sixty for the next one. So that looks like that works. Okay. So if you guys are going, if you're new when you're finding a job, remember this. And it's very similar in, in most languages. All right. So that's going to be it for loops. Now let's go into what's next maps. So I'm going to say 08 underscore maps. And maps are key value pairs. Okay. So let's say main dot go. All right, and we'll copy that, paste that in. Let's clear this up and CD into the right directory. Okay. So, like I said, a map is uh, is a key value pair. So let's go ahead and define a map. So I'm going to call this emails, and what I want this to be is an uh, is a map of uh, names we'll do first names for the key and then emails for the value so let's say emails equals and when we do it this way we want to say make and then pass in map and then a set of brackets and this first data type is for the key okay so the key will be a string and then we want to do the the value the data type for the value which will also be a string okay so that defines a map now let's say assign oops sign we'll say assign key values so we'll say emails and let's say Bob you'd probably do first and last if this was a real life situation but that's fine let's say Bob at gmail.com say Sharon I don't know where these names come from in my mind Sharon. All right. So that gives us two two key value pairs. Um, now let's let's see what happens if we output these. So we'll say print line. Uh, and then let's say emails and we'll run this. Go run main go. And there we go. So it, it shows that it's a map and it shows us the uh, values. OK. So if we wanted to show like just one, like let's say we wanted Bob's email, we could do emails and then 
put in the key, like Bob. This might be a bad example, but you guys get the point. You probably have like an ID for for the um, key because there could be more than one Bob. So this is kind of a stupid example, but it, it gives you the point. So yeah, so it outputs Bob at Gmail. Okay, and you can use the len command for this as well if you want to see the number, like if you want to do or the length of the the map, like how many is in it. So if we do that, we get two. All right, now um, actually let me show you how to delete one. I'm going to add one more here. So let's say Mike. All right, so I want to delete one. So let's print out emails and then let's see. We'll go down here and we'll delete one. So we'll say delete. We just want to do delete and then pass in emails. And then the second parameter is the key. So let's delete Bob. And then we'll just go ahead and print the emails. So I'll copy this. Yeah, so we'll print it out. So at the end, we should see no Bob. So let's run it and right here map. We just have Sharon and Mike. Okay. All right. Now there's we can also assign um, the key value pairs when we declare it like this if we want. So what I'll do is I guess. Yeah, we'll just um, comment these out, I guess. Let's comment out that and that. And let's say declare map and add key values so we can say like emails colon equals and we this time we don't want to use make. We just want to simply say map say string string for the value and then we can do curly braces and we can put in our stuff. So let's say Bob uh, Bob Sharon and I'll just do two. All right, so let's save this and let's see if this works. Okay, so it's, we were printing out the emails, which is this right here. Then we get two because we're printing out the length. We get Bob. And then at the end, we just get Sharon because remember, we delete Bob. So you can do it either way. You can you can you can declare or define the map and then add values. And of course, we could add values to this if we want to add Mike. After that, we could put him right here. And now run it. And you'll see that Mike is in there. Okay, so those are maps. Now let's move on to range. I probably should have did range. Well, no, that wouldn't make sense because range is used to loop through things like maps and arrays and stuff like that. So uh, let's see. Let's create a folder called 09 underscore range. Okay, and then we're going to create main dot go. Let's copy this. And let me just CD into range. All right. So like I said, this is used to to loop through um, arrays, maps, slices. So let's create an array of we'll say IDs. So we'll say actually it'll be a slice. So we'll do just blank brackets here and then let's say int. We'll just put some random numbers in here. All right, so we have our IDs. So let's go ahead and let's loop through IDs using range. So we're going to say for and it is a for loop, but we're going to do this differently. So we're going to say for I and then put a comma here and ID is what we want to use. Uh, within the loop for each one. Okay, for each iteration. And then we're going to do equals range and then IDs because IDs is is what we're looping through. It's this right here. 
All right, and then in here, let's do a FMT dot print F. And what I'm going to do here is do a di uh, digit, not a digit, it's a base 10 int. Uh, and then we'll say dash ID. And then let's do uh, percent D again and put a new line. And then as far as what we want here, we want the index and then we want the ID. All right, so let's see what that gives us. Okay, so what we're seeing here is the index. That's the first thing because that's what is, you know, we have I is the first parameter over here. So that's what's going to be put here. Second one is going to be filled with the ID, which is each one of these. So each iteration is going to put out the ID. Okay. So let's um, and ju just to show you real quick, if we weren't using the index in here, a lot of times you won't be like if I just wanted to do. Actually, let me copy this and let's say not using index. Okay, so if I take this out, we'll just say ID colon D and just use the ID here. You'll see that I'm getting an error and it says I declare to not use. So just like when you define a variable the normal way, if you do it here, you still get that error. So what you would do is you would just put an underscore. Okay, if you're not going to use that, you just put an underscore and then it should work fine. So let's run it and you'll see the second batch here is just ID and then the number. Okay. And you'll see this a lot in Go. So let's actually let's uh, let's add all the IDs together. Add IDs together range is used for a whole bunch of stuff. So let's say some And we're going to set that to zero and then we're going to do a four. I'm not going to use the index. I'm going to do an underscore. Okay, so for ID equals range IDs. And then we can just take that sum and we can say plus equals ID, which is like saying sum equals sum plus ID. It's just a shorthand way of doing it. It's available in most languages. And then let's format our languages I deal with. So print line and then let's say some and some. All right. So this should give us all of the IDs added together. So let's clear this out and run it. Okay, we get our loops and stuff at the end here, though, you see some 199. Okay, so it's just looping through and then adding all of these together. All right, so let's see, let's use a um, Let's use a map because up to this point we've only used slices or arrays um, and I call I call slices arrays a lot. I mean, they're the same thing, really. They're just not, um, you know, finite, whatever. So let's go down here and let's say uh, range with map. So we'll use the same example, the emails. I'll actually just grab that. So we'll take this right here. Yeah, let's put that in and then let's say four. Now here we have key value pairs. It's, it's not like an array where it's just a single value. So we want to say K V and you could use whatever you want. I'm just using K V and then equals range emails. Okay, and then we can say format dot print line and I'm going to use uh, let's see if we go back to Chrome and we go to that formatter, you'll see that percent. S is the uninterpreted bytes of the string or slice. So I'm actually going to use that. That's kind of a weird description, but I'm going to do percent S colon and then another percent S. because I want it to be the the key and the value. And these are just like placeholders. Uh, I could do print line, you know, KV, but, uh, you know, um, concatenate them. But I think this is a, a neater way. So let's do percent S. Make sure we add our new line and then 
we're going to put in the key for the first one and then the value for the next. So we should get the name colon email. What's going on here? Print line call has possible. Oh, I'm sorry. This should be print F. All right, so let's run this and go down to the bottom and you can see now we have our keys colon and then the email. So that's what we did here. Okay. Um, And if you just want to get the key, you can do that as well. Um, let's see if we say four K equals and then do range emails and let's just do an FMT dot print line and I'll do a concatenation. We'll just say the key. Actually, their names so I'll say name and then just concatenate the key. Okay, so now we should just get the names. If we run this down here at the bottom, you'll see name Bob, name Sharon. Wait a minute. Oh, oh okay. I thought I had more than more than that. All right, so I think that's going to do it for range. Um, now what I want to talk about is our pointers. Okay, so let's see, we're going to create a new folder called 10 underscore pointers. And let's create a file called main dot go copy our hello world. Copy it. No. Why the hell isn't it copying? All right. So let's see. Now a, a pointer basically allows you to point to the like the the memory address or the location of a value. Okay, that's in a variable um, and The way that we do this is I'm just going to give you an example here. If I say a is equal to five. okay, and then I'll say B is equal to yeah, ampersand five. I'm sorry, ampersand a. So what this is doing is it's assi it's assigning B to a pointer of a. So let's go down and let's print these both of these out and see what we get. So if we say FMT dot print line Oops. and let's do a and B and see what we get. So we're going to CD into 10. Okay, so we want to run the file and this is what we get. So a is printing out as five B is printing out as this thing. Okay, And some of you may know what this is. Some of you may not. It's a memory address. It's basically where this value is stored on the system. Okay, or in memory, I should say. And, and this is what they look like the zero X and then a bunch of numbers. But yeah, that's that's the memory address. Um, if we want to check the type, let's go ahead and do that. Let's say format dot print F. And remember, for the type, we use percent uppercase T. Uh, we want to do a new line and then let's put in uh, let's look at a. So if we do a, we get int, okay, which is fine. That's to be expected. If we look at B, we get star int. Okay, so the star represents a pointer. So an int and a, a pointer int. these are two different data types. Okay, these are not the same. Now, if you want to read the value from the, the memory address, you can use an asterisk. So let's go down here and I'll just say use to read val from uh, address. So we'll say format dot print line and let's say uh, Asterisk B. If we just do B, it'll give us the, the address. But if we want the value, we can check it out like that. So let's run it and you'll see we get five. Okay. If we do just B, we get the memory address.
Okay, so use that. Um, and it, this is the same thing as doing star and then ampersand a because remember b is set to ampersand a. So this is going to be the same thing five. Okay, now we can actually change the value with the pointer if we want. So let's say change val with pointer. So I could say uh, star b or asterisk b equals. So it's set to five. Let's set it to 10. And then let's go ahead and format dot print line. And I want to now check the value of a because remember B is set to the memory address or the pointer of of uh, a okay or it is a pointer. So let's save that and let's run it. And now down here you'll see that a is equal to 10. So we didn't explicitly change a to 10. We set B to the memory address or we set a pointer to that value and then we changed it. with the asterisk and that actually changed the value of five. And I mean, this is a is not a very practical example because I'm, I want to keep it simple. But the reason you would use pointers is because you might have to pass a lot of data stored at an address. And if you if you choose to pass the address instead of the data itself, it, it can increase performance um, and it can be you know, you can make things faster. Um, they're also used to, to just change values at specific locations. Um, you know, everything in, everything in Go is passed by value. You have other language where you can like pass by reference and stuff like that. Everything in Go is passed by value. All right. And I know that, that that's not the best explanation on pointers, but that's all I have for for this course. All right. So next we're going to take a look at closures. So let's create another folder called 11 underscore closures. And let's create a file in here called main.go. All right, so I'm going to cd into that. All right, so so go can support anonymous functions which can form closures. Um, we can define a function in line without having to name it. So let's copy this. Closures is one of those things that I, I just hate explaining. So I'm just going to kind of show you the syntax. We're going to create a function called adder um, that we can actually set a variable to and then we can use that. We're going to put it inside a loop and have have it add um, uh, all the iterations together. Okay, so let's go ahead and get rid of this and let's create a new function up here. We'll call it adder. And what I'm going to do here is set another function. So an anonymous function with no name, which will take in an int and return an int. And then we're going to set a sum equal to zero. Okay, so it'll start at zero. And then let's return a function that takes in, let's say X, which is an int and we'll return an int. And then we'll take that sum. And we'll just add whatever's passed in. So we'll do plus equals for shorthand and we'll just add whatever's passed in and return the sum. Okay, so very simple function. Um, and then down here, what I want to do is is do a loop where we go one through 10 and then just kind of add add them all. So let's define sum here. And what we can do is we can now assign it to the adder function like that. All right, and then it will create a, a simple for loop. So let's say four and we'll say uh, I is going to be equal to zero. And then we want to say as long as I is less than 10 and we want to increment. And then inside here, we just want to do a format dot print or print line. And we want to use that sum. Now, remember, we set sum to to adder so we can actually pass in a value here, which is just going to be the current index of the the iteration. All right. So it should just kind of keep adding them. So let's save that and let's run this. So we'll say. Uh, go run main dot go. So it starts the iteration at zero and then one 
and then it goes 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 plus 3 is 6, 6 plus 4 is 10, 10 plus 5 is 15. So it just keeps adding the next number in the loop. Okay, so I mean, it's not the most practical example, but I think it's a it's a relatively simple one. Um, but yeah, and I'm, like I said, I'm not very good at explaining. I'm not very, very good at explaining functional programming in general uh, in JavaScript or any other language. That's why I don't do a lot of it. So let's see, we're going to move on to structs. Okay, now structs are, are a very important part of Go. I, I would say one of the most important parts. Um, it's based, they're basically like classes. There's no classes in Go. It's basically like you assign, you create a struct, like let's say for a person, and then they can have different properties like name, age, email, whatever. And then you can have different methods that are associated with that struct. And there's two different types of methods. There's uh, pointer reference. I'm sorry, pointer receivers and value receivers. So I'm going to give you an example of all that stuff. So let's create a new folder called 12 structs. And in here, let's create a file called main.go. Get rid of that. Paste that in and down here, I'm just going to CD into structs. All right, so let's see. First thing we'll do is define a struct. So I'm going to go above the main function and let's say define person struct. Okay, and the way that we do this is we say type and then name it. I'm going to call it person and then struct okay then we want to define the properties we want so i'm going to say first name which is going to be a string last name string uh what else did i have we have a uh, city let's do gender and let's do age okay so that's a struct um, down here, let's initialize a person using this struct. Okay, so we'll say init person using struct. And the way that we do that is create a variable. I'll call it person one and we'll set it equal to person. So this looks very familiar to like, you know, JavaScript classes, um, PHP, Python, all that stuff. Um, so we, will, we just want to attach all of our fields. So let's actually whoops, we want to put in some uh, curly braces here and we can do the property name and then the value. So for instance, let's do Samantha. Last name. What else we got city. Uh, gender for gender I'm going to do M or F I don't mean to offend anybody I don't I don't know any other genders I apologize so age is going to be an int I don't mean to sound disrespectful let's do 25 all right so let's do uh, FMT dot print line person one and let's take a look. So we'll run this. And we get Samantha Smith, Boston, female 25. OK, so we created a person from our person struct. Now, you can also assign without using the um, the property name like this. So just to give you an example. Let's say. Alternative, so we can just take these away. Like that. And that should still work. So if I comment this out and we run this, we should get the same thing. OK, now this is more descriptive in this case because we're, we have just hard coded values. But a lot of times you'll have uh, variables like name, you know, so in that case, you don't really need to, to do this. 
uh, because it's descriptive what this variable is. But in this case, it's just like hard coded um, text. So I want to keep it this way, the first the first way. So let's uncomment that. All right. And then if we want to get a single field, we can say get actually I don't need to put a comment for every single thing. Let's do format dot print line person one dot say first name. If we run that, we get Samantha. Okay, so you can access it. You can also change them. So person one dot age. Uh, let's just do age plus plus or you could do equal something. But now if we print the person, let's just move. Let's move this down here so we can see all the fields after we change the age and you'll see now we get 26. All right. So now let's talk about methods. So we have two kinds of methods, value receivers and pointer receivers and value receivers are are for methods that just do like calculations and stuff. Um, they don't actually change anything. Pointer receivers are for when you actually are changing something. So let's do an example of a value receiver. Now our methods don't go inside the struct. Okay, they don't go like in here like you might think like they would with a class. We're going to go outside of the struct. Okay, and let's say uh, we're just going to do a greeting. So let's say greeting method. And this is a uh, value receiver. So to do this, we're going to say funk. And before we we name the method or the function, we need to put in um, an identifier. So I'm going to use P. You could put anything you want here and then person with the name of the struct. Okay, you could also you could do person if you want, but I'm just going to do P. All right. And then we want to give this a name. I'm going to call it greet and then we want to give it a return value, which is going to be a string. Okay, so this is how we can create a method and all I'm going to do here is return and we're just going to do a greeting. So we'll say hello. My name is now the way that you access um, in this case a person's let's say first name is we need to concatenate because we need to use a variable. We would take P because that's what I used right here. Okay, so I say P dot first name like that. It's it's similar to this, the this keyword in many other languages. Okay, like if you were using ES6 or PHP or something, you would use this dot first name. But here you actually um, you specify an identifier here. Okay, if I were to put person here, it would be person dot first name. So let's do that and let's concatenate a space and then we'll put a uh, last name. So P dot last name and say and I am and let's put our age in here. So or whoever I mean, this is we, this can be used on any person you create. We'll say I am P dot age. All right, so I'm going to save this and you're going to see that we have an error here. So the reason for this is because where I'm returning a string like this, I can't have mismatched um, data types in here and age is an int. Okay, so that's why it's giving me problems. These are strings, which is fine, but I can't just simply put an int in here. So what I'm going to do is change this to a string and I'm going to bring in a, a separate package called string converter or str conv is what it's actually called. So I'm going to go here and just go on a separate line here. And let's say str conv. Okay, so we can bring that in. And that string converter has a method. Let's say str. Why isn't it showing up? String converter dot. And the method is I capital I T O A. Okay, and we're just going to wrap that. Okay, now if I save, you'll see the error goes away. Okay, so that's one solution. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you could you could deal with this. 
um, but that's that's a value receiver. So let's actually call that method. So we'll go down here. I'm going to just comment everything else out and let's do a print line. We'll take person one, Samantha, and we'll call greet. You can see it's actually showing up here. So we'll say person one greet. All right. Now let's clear this up and run it. We get hello. My name is Samantha Smith and I am 25. All right. So that is uh, just a value receiver. And the reason it's a value receiver is because we didn't change anything here. All we did was was take take some of the values that were passed in here and just created an output, a greeting. So let's create a simple um, pointer receiver and we'll change something. So let's say we want a function or a method, I should say, um, to change the age. Like let's say they has birthday, we'll call it. Okay, so let's say um, has birthday method and this is a pointer receiver and it's a pointer receiver because we're going to change something. So to do this, we want to say funk and it's the same idea. We want to give it um, a, a specifier here. And then since it's a pointer receiver, we need to use an asterisk. OK, so we want to say asterisk person, which is the name of the struct. And then let's do has birthday. Um, and this isn't returning anything. It's just changing something. So we don't need to put a return value. And all we're going to do here is actually what we did below where we take the age and we can access that with P dot age plus plus. OK, so let's save that and let's go down here and let's see the greeting actually has the age in it. So I'll just go right before it and I'll say uh, person one dot has birthday. All right. So now when we run this, the age should increase by one. And there we go. I am 26. If they had another birthday or a couple birthdays. 29. All right. So that's a, a value receiver. So let's do let's do another one. Let's do a get married. OK, and the idea is if it's a female, then we're going to change the last name. And I hope nobody takes offense to this. I know that sometimes they don't change the last name. Sometimes the male changes the last name. We're just going with with uh, tradition here. OK, I got to be going to be careful these days because people are so sensitive. But uh, let's say uh, let's say gets married or get married which is a pointer receiver. So funk. OK, we're using the person const, uh, construct the person struct and it's a pointer receiver. So we want to make sure we put the asterisk and then person and let's say get married. OK, now this get married is going to take in a um, spouse last name, which is going to be a string. OK, now what I want to do is test to see if this person is male or female. So I'm going to say if P dot gender is equal to M, then I'm simply going to just return and then else so else then we're going to change P dot uh, last name and we're going to set that to the spouse last name that's passed in. All right, so let's try this out. Now we know Samantha is female, so let's go down here and let's say person. One dot. Uh, get married and we'll pass in, let's say Williams, which is a spouse name. So now let's go ahead and run the greet and we get hello. My name is Samantha Williams and I am 26. All right, so let's create another person. Actually, you know what we'll do instead of keeping this commented out, let's make this person to change it to Bob. 
Johnson, New York, mail, and five. I don't want to make them five. Let's make them 30. All right. So now what we'll do is we'll run person two dot get married. Oops, no semicolons. It's my JavaScript coming out my PHP. So here, let's say um, they married someone with Thompson as the last name. And let's do person two dot greet. See what we get. All right. So we get hello. My name is Bob Johnson and I'm 30. So he did get married to someone with the name of Thompson, but where he's a male, he didn't change his last name. All right. Now, there's one other thing I want to show you. If you want to shorten this up a little bit, if you have a lot of um, different properties here, what you could do is take all the same data types and put them on the same line. So first name, last name, city, gender, and then just say string and then age int. Okay, and then you could I'm just going to comment these out just so you guys have it and save. It, VS Code, if you use prettier, will push this, the int over to the side so these are lined up. But you could also do that. So if I run the go here, it, it still works. All right. So just a shorter way to define this stuff. All right. So now we're going to move on to um, what are we moving on to? Interfaces, which are basically data types that represent um, a set of method structures. Uh, not method structures, method signatures for structs. Okay, so you can define an interface. Uh, for instance, we're going to have an interface called shape that has a method called area, and then we can use that interface on a struct called rectangle and a struct called circle because we want to use that area method in both of those. Okay, so let's create a folder called 13 underscore interfaces and the file called main.go. Okay, so let's grab that. All right, so we're going to use the math package. So we want to wrap this in parentheses and bring in math and we'll put that on a separate line. All right. And then above the main function, we're going to define our interface, which is going to be shape. So we want to say type shape and interface. OK, and then you put all your the methods that you want this interface to implement inside here. And we're just going to have one called area, which returns a float 64. OK, and now we can use this interface with different structs. So we're going to have two structs. One is going to be circle. So I'm going to say type uh, circle struct and let's give it some properties. It'll have X, Y and radius and these will all be float 64. OK, then we'll create a type of rectangle, which will be a struct and this is going to have a width height which will be float 64. All right. So very simple. Um, now what we want to do is create the area method for both of these structs for both the, the circle and the rectangle. All right. So let's say uh, funk and this is going to be a method for the circle. So let's say C uh, circle and this is a, a value pointer because we're just doing a calculation. We're not changing anything. So we don't need the asterisk right here because it's not a, po a pointer receiver or a value. I should have said value receiver. All the terminology kind of is confusing. So let's say funk C circle. And um, it's going to be called area. It's going to return a float 64. Whoops. Not 65, 64. And the calculation here is we want to return. We're going to take pi. So math dot pi. We're going to times C dot radius and then times C dot radius. OK, so that's that. And then we're going to have 
an area method for the rectangle. So let's change this to R. This will be rectangle area. That's the same. And then for the calculation here, we're just going to say R dot width times R dot height. Okay. And then we want one more function called get area. So funk get area. And this is going to take in our interface of shape. And we'll say float 64. And then all this is going to do is simply return our shape dot area method. All right. So now we should be able to initialize a circle and a rectangle and then simply pass it in to get area to get the area. So let's say uh, circle equals. Why do I keep doing that equals. Uh, circle and then we want to pass in a some values. So X is going to be zero. Y is going to be zero and radius is going to be five. Okay, and then rectangle. It's going to equal. Rectangle and we're going to pass in width. So width will be 10 and let's say. Height will be five. Spread these out a little. Okay, so now we have our circle and rectangle. Now I just want to wrap these and get area and print it out. So let's say uh, format dot will do print F. And we'll say circle. Oops. Area. And we're going to use a percent F and then a new line and then we're just going to pass in here the circle. All right, and then we'll do the same thing for the rectangle. And that's it. Let's try it. So I'm going to CD into what is it? 13 interfaces and let's run the file. And there we go. Uh, circle area. Wait a minute. The hell that's not right. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> I'm just printing out these. I didn't wrap it in get area. So we want to wrap this in the get area. All right. So now that should get the area. There we go. So circle area for this is going to be 78.5 dot five, blah, blah, blah. Rectangle area is going to be 50. Okay, so that is an example of an interface. So basically just a list of methods that you can implement on different structs. I don't know what these are. Should have comment or be unexported. These are just like tips. Um, linting or whatever. All right, so the last thing we're going to look at is web. So let's close this up and let's create uh, one more folder called 14 underscore web. And I'm going to create a file called main dot go. Okay, I'm also going to CD into that. Oops. All right. So let's bring over our hello world. And we're going to bring in uh, another package to work with the web to deal with like HTTP requests and stuff like that. And that's called net slash HTTP. OK, I want to put that on a separate line. And then what we'll do is in here. Uh, we need to take that HTTP object and call handle funk. OK, now this is kind of like a router. It takes in a route. So I'll do slash and then it, you can put in a function to deal with that route, which I'm going to say index. OK, and then up here 
I'm going to say funk index. And this takes in two special parameters that have to do with that uh, HTTP module. So it's going to take in a W and it has a special type of HTTP dot uh, response writer. Oops. So response writer and then it takes in an R which is going to have a pointer method of HTTP dot request. OK, and then in here, if we want to output something to the browser, we can use format dot F print F. OK, which takes in a formatting receiver, which is going to be W. And then the next parameter is whatever we want to output. So we'll just say. Hello world. All right. Now let's save that down here. In order for this to work, in order for us to basically serve, we need to take HTTP and call listen and serve. OK, it's kind of like with Express, like app dot listen. OK, it takes in a port. So we're going to say uh, colon, let's say 3000 and then The second parameter is going to be just nil, which is just like none, like nothing. And that should actually run a web server. So let's try it out. Okay, so you see how it's kind of like hanging here. Actually, what I can do is I'll control. Um, yeah, control C to stop. I'm going to put just a little message in here. So I'll say FMT dot. Um, print line and let's say server starting just so it doesn't just hang there like that and then we'll run it we get server starting and now let's go to our browser and we should be able to go to localhost colon 3000 and there it is hello world okay and we can actually put html in here if we want so if i say h1 and save that. Oh, I think we have to restart the server though. Let's reload. Yeah, so we just have to stop this and start it back up. And now if we reload, we get hello world. Okay? If you wanted to do another route, we could copy this down. We could say this one this will be an about function and we want it to be slash about. And I could just copy this. and call it about and then we'll change the text and save let's restart the server down here and check it out so that still works and if we go to slash about there we go all right and there's like um I mean, Go is really good to build like REST APIs and, and stuff like that, microservices. Uh, but you can also use like template engines, template languages, whatever, if you want. Um, there's a lot that you can do with the web. And I really want to start getting into it. And that's the point of this whole course is to prepare you guys for that. So, you know, at least the basics, how to create, you know, variables and arrays and all that stuff to deal with, um, you know, maps and structs, which are very, very important. Um, so that's it, guys. I know this was a freaking long video. I think this was the longest video I've ever made. Um, so, you know, if you made it to the end, thank you. you. You must really like my content if you were willing to sit through all of that. But thanks. Thanks for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, if you like the video, please leave a like and I will see you next time.